the fact is, uh, even for kids who um, do have significant needs in school, we know more about how to help them, support them, and teach them than we, than we ever have before. And so to me, that's really, really exciting. That's Jim Artisani, Associate Dean in UMaine's College of Education and Human Development, talking about heading back to school. The first day of school. Even if you haven't been to school in more than 40 years, like some of us, we can all remember that combination of fear, excitement, anticipation, and a thousand other emotions that the first day back can make you feel. I'm Ron Lisnett, and this is the Main Question Podcast from the University of Maine. Thanks for joining us for the first episode of season seven of our show as we take you back to school. The education of our kids has always been a challenge, but these days seem to contain more challenges, conflicts, and opportunities than most other eras. The effects of COVID, distance learning, anxiety and depression, politics in education, teacher and worker shortages, book banning. The list of issues facing schools, teachers, and administrators is as long as it is challenging. One of the most pressing issues as the school year began was the severe shortage of teachers and other personnel. Many school districts in Maine were struggling to fill positions, to say nothing of other folks that make schools work, substitutes, bus drivers, food service workers. At UMaine's College of Education and Human Development, these issues are well known and much work is being done to address them. We sat down for a sort of roundtable discussion of the state of education in Maine and beyond with the Dean of the college, Penny Bishop, and two of her colleagues. Despite all of the challenges, there are exciting developments in the field of education. In this episode, our main question, are you ready to go back to school? We kicked off our chat with some introductions and some memories of that first day of school. So my name is Courtney Angelo Santi, the coordinator for Maine PBIS, which stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. For me, school was never anxiety producing. I come from a family of educators. I've always loved school, and I think for me, what I loved most about those first days back was the social pieces. It was seeing my friends after the summer, seeing who was going to be in my classes, opportunities to make new connections. Um, it was always an exciting time. Hi, I'm Penny Bishop. I'm uh, Dean of the College of Education and Human Development at the University of Maine. And for me, um, the start to school uh, typically coincided with my birthday. So I had some pretty exciting feelings about that time of year. But as I became a teacher, I will say that that's when the anxiety started to kick in, that, that, that opportunity and challenge of uh, creating relationship and rapport with a new set of kids each year um, is, was both daunting and, uh, and rewarding. Two sides of a coin, excitement and anxiety. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Jim, how about you? Yeah, I'm Jim Artisani, and I'm Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research here at the University of Maine. As a child, um, the first day of school was always a little bit frustrating because, it, to me, it marked the end of summer and, uh, and the kind of the, the freedom to uh, hang out with my friends. But um, as I get older, uh, I think, particularly in high school, um, it was it was exciting uh, to think about getting back into the swing of things and engaging in the kinds of activities that that I enjoyed doing in high school. Uh, at, in a university setting, and, and and even as a as a when I was teaching in public school, um, I, I I always look forward to it. I, I begin to rev up uh, as August as we get into August, and um, I find it stimulating to uh, to think about and get ready for the start of the school year. It, it's different than when you're in, in high school. I mean, you're still in education, so there's right. still that, that dynamic, right? Yes. So as we dive into this, let's try to uh, get a big picture view of what is the state of education. What are some of the hot button issues teachers are dealing with in the classroom and, and you in the college? You're, you're trying to get your arms around. Penny, let's maybe start with you. Sure. Well, I, I think one of the biggest things that people will probably um, have noticed from any, any media source lately is this human capital shortage, if you will, that um, we are really working hard to increase and diversify the teacher workforce um, and the, the leader, educational leader workforce as well. So you'll note that um, you know, there are plenty of schools in Maine and beyond that are opening without full staffs this year. Um, so there's a real challenge in that regard. And then we're seeing increased political divisiveness. So certainly schools, school boards, teachers um, you know, are facing uh, greater challenges to um, curriculum, to policies, to practices. And that 
doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. So those are things that we're focusing on. So for anybody that can jump in here, one of the major colleges in the state that is training teachers, what, what can you do as an institute of higher education to, to help in that regard? One of the things we're working on in terms of increasing and diversifying the workforce is to open up flexible pathways to teaching. So increasingly we are partnering with a lot of school districts to uh, create teacher residencies. We are creating grow your own options where we're working closely with principals to identify folks who are in their communities, maybe already working in their schools, who are interested in, in moving into teaching positions and supporting them in that way. We are also working in partnership with Maine Indian Education to identify identify different pathways to teaching for more Wabanaki teachers as well as to educate non-Wabanaki educators around um, Wabanaki studies and other ways uh, to be culturally responsive in the classroom. Now for anyone here, I think a recent article in the paper said that in the year 2021 more than 2,000 teachers retired or left their jobs in the state of Maine. What are some of the factors that lead, lead to that number, Jim? I think as Penny mentioned, the politi politicalization of, of education over, well, it probably has always been this way to some extent, but particularly over the last um, five years or so, there are a lot of uh, people who are, are taking shots at education. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of easy to, uh, because we all went to school, it's easy for us to think that we know how schools operate, even though we may have gone to school 40 or 50 years ago, or even 10 years ago. Uh, schools have changed. Uh, so rapidly, uh, what schools do now uh, with kids uh, is so far beyond uh, what it was like for certainly for myself as a as a youngster going to school. Courtney, any thoughts from you? Sure. I, you know, I worked with a school counselor last year, someone I ha I respect a lot, and I've worked with across years. And she told me she was leaving because she couldn't cope with the sadness. Right. So, just an overwhelming need based on COVID nineteen and the instability it's caused in our communities is being experienced and felt in our schools. And now we have educators trying to respond to those needs, sometimes it, with a lack of resources or without any access to resources because of the remote nature of how we experienced you know, the educational platform last year and the year before. So services weren't happening, have not have been happening. We've had kindergartners coming into school with um, significant developmental needs gone without any pre-K or early intervention services. And so I don't know if in our history we've experienced that, but that's being felt in our schools. So we're being asked to do more without resources. In some cases, teachers are faced with either not being able to meet the needs of students or not having students come to school because the workforce uh, capacity is, is so stretched. So these aren't circumstances under which teachers are feeling rewarded, that they're feeling um, efficacious. They're not tapping into why they got into education in the first place. They're just in survival, and their bandwidth is, is stretched to capacity. Furthering that point, uh, how close might this year be to a normal school year? Are we never going back to that? That's a good question. I'm not sure. Right now, in my past month, I've been working with a lot of schools, over 30 directly, there's a positive buzz. I think teachers, students are excited to get back into the classroom. They're ex excited to have some of the COVID restrictions relaxed. And that new school year buzz is, is about us. Um, I'm not sure how long that will last. I think that we're going to experience some of this, the stretching with the significant workforce shortage again. We have students who need help, and so, you know, how are we going to provide for their needs if we can't fill these positions and fill them with professionals who are equipped to do it, to do the job well? Penny, what was learned from the pandemic mm -hmm. that, that might be kept? Are there any positive or negative impacts of distance learning, perhaps, that... Uh, the pandemic forced upon us that might be used going forward? Sure, I think 
I, you know, I think I've, I've heard a number of things come uh, anecdotally, but I also conducted some research during the remote emergency teaching switch. So right as, right as schools moved to that first spring of COVID, did some research with about 350 educators, asking them really what that, asking them that question, sort of reflecting back on that moment, um, what actually might have improved. And one of the things that came forward that surprised me actually was family involvement, that families were more engaged because kids were at home and that's when the schooling and where the schooling was happening. There were a lot of interesting insights into that piece. I would say also that educators were somewhat forced to streamline what they were teaching and forced to identify what really matters in a different way, um, knowing that they really needed to identify the the critical concepts, the critical skills, um, and, and strip it down to the to the the core of what the essence is that they're that they want students to come away knowing and being able to do. Um, so that was another thing that that educators themselves identified. Of course, technology skills also skyrocketed, but but those two pieces I thought were pretty interesting and unexpected. Jim, you mentioned earlier some of the hot button issues and some of the controversies that that schools and teachers are dealing with, whether it's race or inclusivity or violence in schools. These are creating divisions in, in our society and, and we're seeing that at school board meetings or in conflicts with parents. How do we try to navigate through that, those contentious issues? The expectation is that schools will meet the needs of all students. Earlier I mentioned that uh, schools do more for, for, for kids now than they've ever done, um, even as, as resources have um, been depleted. The expectation is that schools will provide educational services and other supports that students need to grow into, into healthy, productive adults. Schools are educating a more more diverse student body in a time where there's a lot of polarization in our in our country and, in, and around the world. I think one of the the nice things that came out of remote and then moving to hybrid and returning is a focus on wellness. So the uh, picture of a student as being more than an academic body, that um, there's a whole child in front of us. So thinking about checking in with them to support their self-monitoring of their emotions, self-regulation, self-advocacy when they found themselves really struggling, and normalizing asking for help. So I think that I heard that certainly in my children's classrooms. Um, I heard that in the schools that I've been supporting is um, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay to ask for help. And I think that those are themes that we'll see continue and uh, and I hope are here to stay um, because we know that the mental health toll on our society as a collective increased during COVID. Um, you know, in another area too that I'm thinking about as we've built up our knowledge and our fluency with technologies, there are some students that did better learning remotely, that they felt more comfortable um, accessing the content, engaging with the material and their teacher in that platform. So for you know a certain percentage of our youth that have been at risk that might have some school refusal, we might have developed an access point for them that might not ever disappear, that we can continue to teach and engage even um, remotely. May I jump in on that? Please. Because I do wonder the extent to which some of that um, results from teachers increasingly personalizing education. And that is another piece that I, I saw happen more was this awareness that not all students are getting um, the same, are benefiting from the same approach, which we know uh, over time is, this has always been the case, but the opportunity for that sort of delivery to happen in a variety of ways um, based on students' needs and interests and abilities seems to have increased. I feel like teachers did a lot more personalizing during that time, and I'm hopeful that that would continue as well. Penny, what are some of the trends in terms of uh, young people choosing to become a teacher, and what here in the college are you doing to make it more attractive and more of an option? Mm -hmm. Well, certainly the trend is downward, unfortunately, and perhaps not surprisingly, that fewer and fewer people are choosing to become teachers. So before the pandemic, um, nationally we saw teacher education uh, in enrollment um, decline by 30% uh, in 10 years. We know that during the pandemic that continued to go downward. And so we are at a challenging time uh, in teacher education and, and thinking about how we continue to staff our schools with quality professionals. It is a 
conundrum, but we do know a few things. Um, I mentioned before the idea of a grow your own program, and that we do know is particularly effective for rural, rural and isolated communities, that identifying folks who are already in communities and encouraging them to become educators is a really good way to ensure that we retain the teachers that we have or um, recruit teachers who will stay in those communities. Um, so that's one strategy that we're using. Another is this idea of the teacher residency. Education is one of the few professions where you do not have a paid internship. In fact, you have to take perhaps time away from a job in order to do what was this called one student teaching. And um, that places a lot of people at a disadvantage um, and it makes it inequitable and inaccessible for many. And so we are partnering with districts to make sure that our students who are pre-service teachers can become teachers while having paid internships which does does change things dramatically so that makes it a um, more accessible as well and then another way in which we're doing that is to uh, increase the accessibility and flexibility of our programming so that people have more ways to access it also trying to make it a more affordable option um, in terms of increasing our uh, scholarships and other ways in which there's uh, there's loan forgiveness for folks like that so there are there are a number of policy levers we can also use, um, but it's going to be a multi-pronged approach. Maybe let's talk about some of the latest new initiatives in education. Jim, what, what is SEL and why is that important to educators? Sure. So I think as Courtney mentioned earlier, we often, we often view uh, education from the standpoint of the academic perspective, but the, the reality is uh, children are, are growing, all aspects of the child is, is, is growing and developing, and in all of those different uh, areas that, that they're, they're growing in uh, require support. Just like we would provide academic, uh, academic support and instruction, uh, students also need to have um, support and instruction around so what we refer to as social-emotional learning, um, which is it, it's really just uh, helping students to learn learn the skills that they need to be successful at that particular time in school and, and out of school uh, in, their, in their social environments, um, and then to continue to develop those, those skills over time. Oftentimes we think that social emotional learning is something new to schools. Um, it, it may not have had that, that particular label, but it's really something that it's really unavoidable. Um, so it, it doesn't, it's not accurate to say that we never used to do that in schools. Um, there's no way you could do school and not be doing that. Um, maybe you could be doing it poorly, um, but uh, but it had to have been. It's always been happening, but now we're doing. We're, we're more careful. We're more intentional in terms of how we go about doing that. We love our acronyms in academia, so let's try another one. Courtney, what is PBIS, and what is happening with that here at UMaine? Yeah, so PBIS stands for Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. It's an implementation framework. It's multi-tiered. It's from maximizing the selection of those evidence-based practices that we um, adopt and um, implement in schools. Um, we know a lot about what works with youth at risk, about how to build systems that are responsive and equitable. PBIS is that framework or that implementation blueprint so that those ideas become a lived experience in schools. So it's a framework, and it's a continuum of supports that promote academic, social, emotional, and behavioral competence of every student that attends. It's important to know that PBIS has been around for a while, and it has growing research, making it one of the longest-running technical assistance centers in our country. It's linked to reductions in discipline, increases in emotional regulation, decreases in aggressive behavior, um, improved academic engagement and achievement, perceptions of organizational health and safety improve when, when schools implement, increased perceptions of school climate, and reductions in teacher turnover. So all things that, you know, are those hot topics that we're talking about. This is a, this is a framework to help our schools get there. In Maine, it's growing. So the Maine Department of Education was awarded a state personnel development grant called, we refer to it as the SPDIG, and it identified PBIS as one of the top priorities. So as a result, I entered into a cooperative agreement with, between the University of Maine and the department to coordinate the effort. I work in a leadership team, and we're scaling the number of schools um, in a cohort model. Our cohort model is running its second year right now. Schools 
join and they partner with 17 to 18 other schools. They're in that cohort for three years to build their tier one system. Well, currently we have two cohorts running, so we're supporting uh, about 35 schools um, in that tier one process. We also have schools in an advanced tier process because they have reached fidelity at the tier one level. Now they're building their systems to support youth that are showing some sign of uh, risk that we want to respond to in a timely way. I will also say that we have um, launched our first training of trainers for Maine PBIS using the micro-credential system at the University of Maine. So this um, credentialing process will take our candidates about 18 months to complete. It includes coursework, applied practice, indirect application in schools. So that's new. It just started um, last month. And last, we have our University of Maine Graduate Certificate Program for RTI for Behavior, which is our multi-tiered PBIS framework. There's significant overlap in dovetailing with all of these things. So what I see is we draw in to the University of Maine a number of uh, students to our grad certificate program because of our work in our cohorts and vice versa. We, I have students in this certificate program that recruit their schools to join the cohort. So it's a nice way that we're um, supporting Maine at our, in our college. Penny, maybe a couple questions about the college. It's about more than just training K through 12 teachers. You have other programs, you have uh, uh, you know, other disciplines almost. Uh, maybe you could talk about some of those, mm -hmm. which are growing, where, where are you headed? With sure, this? yeah, thanks for that question. We are, we are a college of education and human development, and that's really important because it enables us to uh, work across some of those disciplinary boundaries. We have three schools, each of which has teacher education in it, but is, it is far from the only thing that we do. So in addition to preparing educational teachers and leaders, we are also providing service to the state in terms of human uh, development and child development and family studies. We are um, also strengthening uh, the, the physical side as well as the mental side with uh, our athletic training and our kinesiology and exercise science. Um, we have uh, a very uh, um, deep team uh, in our uh, special education program. Um, we really are doing things that cut across a lot of different areas. One, one of our newest programs, which is really exciting, is at our outdoor leadership program. And it's a way to provide both educators and sort of informal uh, educators with um, the skills um, and dispositions and conservation ethic to go out into outdoor spaces and lead people um, safely and uh, with inspiration. And we're seeing some uh, some growth there that's really exciting as well. We are a college that is uh, about 50% undergraduate and 50% graduate. So a lot of what we do is at the master's and doctoral level. Um, and we do provide the highest enrollment in most teachers, uh, teacher candidates in the state. Um, so we are uh, a big provider in that way, which is uh, a terrific opportunity for us to, to serve the state and to, to influence it in pretty powerful ways. Let's talk about the, the grad program there. That Does the college provide a substantial number of uh, administrators, policy makers for education in Maine, and what influence does it have on yeah. education in the state big picture? Yeah, we really, we absolutely do. So um, we have a terrific educational leadership program. We do define leadership in a broad way. Um, and at the same time, a lot of administrators either go into and or come out of um, that program as a result. Uh, in fact, that program had been uh, admitting folks on a biennial uh, basis, so we were only able to accept cohorts every other year, and we're really, really excited about the fact that as of this year, we'll, we're moving to an annual admission cycle, so we're very uh, hopeful that we'll be able to, to increase the support for the state at the, at the leader and policy level as well. I would add to that that our higher education program does some Something similar in, at, at the higher ed level, and so we prepare leaders and and folks who are in student affairs uh, at in institutions across the state and well beyond. So we're preparing pres presidents of community colleges. We're you know providing division directors at uh, human service agencies. Um, we really are in many ways, I think, the backbone of uh, the state for a lot of social services and educational services. So maybe this is a question for for all of you: technology. No, obviously, it, it is a big part of all of our lives. Is it playing an increasing role in education? What some of the what are some of the tech trends and innovations that we're likely to see come on board here in the coming years? Earlier, you would, you had asked about uh, uh, the, the pandemic and, and the move to uh, online instruction or different instructional formats, and that's something that we've embraced, particularly at, at the uh, graduate level. So, 
many of our programs now are uh, online, completely online, and the others are uh, doing some kind of hybrid instruction. So that that's had a significant impact um, in the state in the sense that working professionals don't have to drive to campus uh, to, to complete their graduate degree. So they can get advanced training through online instruction. Um, and, and with technologies like Zoom, for example, you can have face-to-face and real-time instruction and uh, everybody can be together and everybody can see everybody. So uh, technology is, and, and in some ways the pandemic, I know for a fact that the pandemic kind of pushed us in that direction, maybe with some programs that were a little bit skeptical about whether that was the way to go and and, and found out because we had to, um, we had to get our, we had to jump into that with both feet. And uh, so some, a, a number of programs have become fully online as a result of that experience. Are there other tech trends, anything coming down the pike that are either daunting or exciting? In terms of technology, what I see that's the promising or exciting is access. We're seeing families a bit more engaged because they can attend from anywhere. They can attend from work if they're uh, a parent that's working during the day. Um, so increased attendance at things like IEP meetings or virtual parent nights. Um, for parents who have kids at home. So I'm, I'm seeing technology used to increase access in more equitable ways than maybe our traditional methods of engaging families. That's it's pretty much what I'm um, most excited about. And is that important in a rural state where distances, travel distances might be a challenge? Yeah, so I think a lot of problem solving has happened in how do we get access to our families that may not have had access. Um, I can't say we're there because I don't think that we are, but I think we've made significant progress in that area. Penny, anything else you'd point to that uh, that's coming down the pike? Well, I'd love to to just mention that I think um, AI and VR are both really pieces that are um, exploding in education. So augmented uh, reality and virtual reality, and um, I think are are. I, we've seen, you know, in the past 10 years, I'd say a huge amount of growth, and I think we'll continue to see that. One great example of that that we have here in the college is um, is the work of Justin Dimmel in his um, IMRI, I know we love acronyms, is IMRI Lab, Immersive Mathematics and Rendered Environments Lab, and it's just a, a great example of, of the way in which uh, technology can completely change how we think about teaching and learning. Great. YouTube and Google are tools of the trade now, right? Absolutely, they are. So we've talked about a lot of challenges and some controversies and things, but what excites you? What I mean, I, you can't think of a profession where you can really affect youth in the future more than being a teacher. Anybody that goes into it has to love that. But So what excites you as we think about where education is headed mm-hmm. for all of you? Well, one of the things that I I like to say is that our college is all about strengthening individuals, communities, and uh, families, and, um, and schools. And so as I think about education in general, it's about it's it's the strengthening that we do as a profession that excites me. It's a, an opportunity to lift up not just uh, individuals, but whole communities. And I think that's the kind of collective work we need to be doing as a state. Um, so I'm just, that's what excites me about being in this work. And I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic about, about what lies ahead. Courtney, how about, what do you, how about you? What do you think? I think that we are moving into an era that does recognize the whole child, the whole person. It um, takes into consideration the mental health and well-being, not just the academic piece. We know that's important. It's always been important. It's it's not any less important, but now it's more balanced. Um, And in in the same way, we're seeing that the well-being, the efficacy of teachers in schools matters. We want to recruit teachers and have them want to stay, which means we have to examine all kinds of variables that lead to that. So I think we're looking at that. We have to look at that. Um, and, and with that challenge is an opportunity to, to do it a little bit better going forward. And I also think that we're also, with the, the, the social injustice that we we're experiencing, is calling on schools to create equitable systems representative of a wide variety of stakeholders and we're seeing some inroads there too about what that looks like, how to do it better, and to make sure that the systems that we create are co-created with the stakeholders that they're for. And I think we're making progress there. Jim, your thoughts? Yeah, I, um, and just 
going off of what Penny and, and Courtney was just saying. So it is about strengthening, and um, it, what we, the work that we do in our college is about strengthening schools and, and communities. We're at a time when, when our knowledge about, about how to do what we do is growing uh, exponentially as it is in, in other fields as well. Uh, maybe not as recognized as much. I, again, I think most of the general public tends to think about school in terms of their own experiences in school. Schools do more for kids now than, than, they've, than they've ever done. There's a need for schools to do more, um, but we're also better equipped to do that. Uh, earlier we talked about teachers leaving the profession and turn, high turnover rates and, and things like that. Um, one, of the, one of the areas that's often uh, pointed to why, why are teachers leaving the field and folks will say, well, kids are more challenging than they used to be. And, and that's a little bit hard to quantify. But the fact is, uh, even for kids who um, do have significant needs in school, we know, more about, we know more about how to help them and support them and teach them than we, than we ever have before. And so to me, that's really, really exciting. Well, if I had three apples, I would give you all apples right now. But thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks for thank the opportunity. For us. Yes, thank you. Thanks for joining us. We're lining up some great stories for you this fall. We hope you come back around and check them out. All of our episodes are available in the places you get your podcasts from, typically Apple and Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. They also appear on UMaine's Facebook and YouTube pages. Any questions or comments, send them along to mainquestion at maine.edu. This is Ron Luznet. We'll catch you next time on The Main Question.